team tomorrow. I want Steve Warren to sort. The most resilient guy I've ever played against was Steve Wall. Very gritty, determined. He's a stubborn, stubborn cricketer. Steve is always renowned for scoring runs when they mattered most. If the team was in trouble, it kind of was up to him. He wanted his team to play attacking, aggressive cricket, um, and that's what they did. You know, not only did he want us to win from ball one, he wanted us to crush the opposition from ball one. Ruthless is one of his favourite words. He wanted records, he wanted numbers. If he asked me to run through a brick wall now, I'd run as hard as I could. Steve demanded success on any given day. We were never going to lose. And it felt amazing. In the 60s, the chapels were the boys most likely to succeed. And they did. In the 80s, it's the War family who's most likely to succeed. 19-year-old Stephen, his twin brother Mark, 15-year-old Dean and 10-year-old Daniel. Mum and Dad were very good sports people and they had uh, Mark and myself, we were obviously twins. Um, my parents had us when they were 19 so they were very young and they were very good tennis players and that sort of cut short their sporting aspirations by having us. Um, and then I had two other brothers as well so it was four boys growing up in the western suburbs of Sydney and we lived and breathed sport, you know, 24-7. It was all we were thinking about. We were playing, practicing, dreaming of doing something in sport, um, playing imaginary test matches in the backyard playing soccer and football, tennis. You always hear the stories with Stephen about his backyard cricket with his, um, with his brothers and the fights and arguments, and you can actually picture what it would be like. Uh, they didn't outwardly try and outdo each other, but I think internally there was, a, there was that, you know, that, that bit of brotherly rivalry there. It really was uh, an environment that was very competitive, and we sort of played hard and fair from young ages, and that's just the way we were brought up. <laughs> While the backyard would provide the basis for Stephen Moore's sporting aspirations, his journey to the summit of Australian cricket began here, at Bankstown Cricket Club in West Sydney. My uh, first memory of both Steve and Mark was uh, when they were eight-year-old playing in the local under-10 competition here. They, at that stage, they were head and shoulders above anybody else. They flew through the, through the junior systems um, and then I think Stephen played state cricket at about 19. Even then I think yeah, there was that real steely determination that, that's carried him right through his career. You know, you could tell that he played every game with a real intensity and a real passion. He was probably only 19, 20 years of age and, and probably before his time, before he matured and he found himself, he's playing test cricket and we're, and we're in the middle of a, you know, our, our toughest period of time. My overwhelming emotion was, was just nerves and just trying to get through the match. You know, just enjoy the moment, you know, it's, it's something that we've, we've dreamt about. Walking out to the MCG with a, a baggy green cap on my head, 40, 50,000 people, it still was an amazing thrill and 
when I took centre and faced the first ball off Ravi Shastri, my goal was to get through the first ball. And uh, that was pretty courageously played there. And I did that, then my next goal was to try and score a run. I got that, and I think I got out for 13. And he's gone. I can't lie and say that, um, you know, it was the greatest experience of my life, and I was excited and happy, and I was more worried about how I was going to go. Um, so it wasn't really the, uh, the Cinderella story, but it was a great honour never, nevertheless, and some people never get their chance to play for Australia. Despite that shaky start in December 1985, a young Steve War showed enough promise with both bat and ball to become a continued presence in Australia's test side. Well, Steve was a, a young guy that was exceptionally talented. Uh, you know, bowl, bat, field. He was a lot more flamboyant player in those days. You know, played almost a shot of ball type scenario where he was a thrashing machine as a, as a young batsman. If you look at the early Steve Waugh, he's imagined to be filling all these different roles. He's meant to be sort of a first change bowler, he's meant to be a, um, an attacking batsman who bats at number seven, uh, and then he bats at number three for a period, and then he's sort of plugged in at number six. But his lack of a steady role led to a significant dip in form and a crisis of confidence. He went through that period of time of getting the confidence to know that he belonged in Test cricket. I was very fragile, uh, yeah, so insecure, and um, and really not knowing whether I was good enough to have a long career. Um, I, there was a lot of moments where I sat in the room by myself and thought, "Am I good enough for this? Uh, what am I doing?" You can see there was potential there, but it certainly took him, you know, a few years to really sort of nut it all out and work out what Test cricket was all about. You could just see him growing, embracing the culture and coming out as a man. I learned a lot from the first couple of years of struggling and not really knowing myself and my game. I had a great Ashes tour in 89 which turned around, I got a couple of hundreds and started to believe. Stephen really dominated 177, 100 at Lords I think, and he was away. Once he got that first one he was cool. He had that shot where the, the medium paces bowl one wide and he'd just do that with his wrist. And the ball would just sing away right along the carpet and you wondered, how the hell, where, how did he play that shot? War's back-to-back -back hundreds in the first two tests of the 1989 Ashes paved the way for Australia's 4-0 victory, only their second series win since 1984. It proved both a watershed moment for Alan Border's Australia and for Steve War. When he was going, he, he, he was just a boundary hitter, Stephen, but he was determined. He hated getting out. Stephen on that tour got on a roll. It was just confidence. We just grew and grew, and the support and the team spirit in the dressing room was magnificent. You can't believe that he'd play as well as he did in that series, and then uh, uh, not that long later, a year or a year and a half later, he got dropped from the Australian team. Seems incredible. After a return to indifferent form, an ever-fragile Steve Waugh was dropped during the 1991 Ashes series. His twin brother, Mark, replaced him in the side. I think when War lost his place, he realised just how much he valued being uh, an Australian player and sought to carve out a niche for himself in the future. That's a testimony to you know, strength of character, to, to reinvent yourself, to, to get yourself back into the side. Um, and and you know, having done it a couple of times, you know, there's a steely resolve that uh, is the upshot of that. And his character developed as a result of those setbacks. I acquired that mental toughness over a period of time. It was always that internal boxing match, negative, positive in your mind. The key was to get the positive stuff out at the right time. That meant that um, a lot of the quite stylish aspects of, of the early Steve War, a lot of the aggression, a lot of the panache, a lot of the nonchalance, had to disappear from his game. I think I look back at significant innings was here in 1993 to Trent Bridge where I had to bat the last session to try and save a test match. And I was naturally a stroke maker for most of my career, but I said to myself, in order to save this test match, I, I can't play a shot for the next two hours to save, save the game. And I didn't know whether I could mentally do that, be that, be that dedicated and that uh, committed to it. And uh, after two hours of hardly playing a shot, we saved the test match. And I thought to myself, if I can get through that where it's unnatural and do it, any task and achieve it because that was really hard for me to do. I did it and that was a breakthrough in my mind. 
He would need to call upon that mental fortitude when Australia travelled to the West Indies in 1995. Now fully established in the side, it was a chance to prove himself against the best in the world. We went to the West Indies to try and knock off the West Indies over t after 20 years of dominance. We had put them on a pedestal and uh, they were like, they were, they were different to the rest of us. We played the first test in Barbados and beat them. And all of a sudden, you, you thought, hang on, just for a couple of minutes, maybe these guys aren't as confident as we think they are, maybe they're slipping a little bit. That resounding win in the first test meant it would be all to play for when the teams met again in Trinidad. We were really up against it. It's a game that we had to win. Like, it's the greenest wicket in the world. It is green, horrible, the worst. And we were about six for 50 or 60, and Ambrose is all over us. Ambrose is beating the bat, and getting us out, and, and Steve was in there, and he was, he was batting away and, and battling away like he, you know, we know he could. Steve won myself have had a lot of battles. We are two highly competitive cricketers. He'd always be over you, looking at you, and uh, you know, not far away. And first ball to the last ball was always the same pace. His bouncer was always at your throat. To me, it's test cricket at its best. Man. You know, two great performers. Um, you know, not backing or not giving an inch. I was born to him. You know, I'm a normal steer and all that stuff. And apparently, he 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 swear to me. I think Steve said something that uh, probably shouldn't have, but he rolled that Ambrose up. The confrontation with Curtly, that was a moment of madness from my, on my behalf. Steve was said, you know, to F off. You know, something to that, that effect. I'm not sure too many people have actually said that to Curtly Ambrose. I asked him, really, do you swear with me? And he didn't say yes, he didn't say no. He just said, I can say what I want. So that tells me he did say it. And then, that's when I lost control, you know? <laughs> Richie Richardson ran up, grabbed hold of him by the arm and pulled him away. At the time, I think he was probably keen to kill me at that moment. I said to him, don't ever swear to me again. You understand? Or else I will knock you out out here. I have no career left. I could do what I got to do with you. I get banned me from cricket, I don't care. I, I really lost it. And it was the moment Steve Moore assumed leadership of Australian cricket because we're all sitting there going, mate, I remember I was 12th or 13th, man, I had tingles up my spine going, are you crazy? I said, but if you're going to stand up to Ambrose in these conditions, mate, we'll, I'll go to war with you. That was probably symbolic as well. It was um, more so for the rest of the team watching. We were basically said, OK, we've had enough. We're not going to bow down to you guys. We're actually going to get back into your, in your face. Could have been done probably in a more subtle way. <laughs> but it showed that we weren't going to be intimidated by anyone and that's the way Stephen plays and that's the way the Australian team played and was going to play. At the end of the day, I was quite happy that I didn't really beat Steve Waugh because Australia would have lost a great cricketer. You know, he probably would have been dead or something, you know. <laughs> I look back, that was, you know, it was a, probably one of the highlights of my career, you know, taking Kurt Leon and having that confrontation against probably the, the guy I respected most in any opposition team. War's gritty, unbeaten 63 was not enough to stave off defeat, but a point had been made. The teams travelled to Jamaica for the final and deciding test, and once again, Steve War would play the pivotal role. His innings in Jamaica was fantastic. That was our last frontier. His reputation by then was, was set, you know, if, if he gets in, he's going to go big. Um, he likes a fight, he, he likes a situation that's tough. And um, he certainly came in with things sort of evenly balanced and pretty much took the game away from us. His nickname's the Iceman, so he loves it tough, and the tougher it is, the, the better he goes. And, you know, to get 200 there in Jamaica on that wicket was pretty tough work. We went on to, to win that test match, seal the, the series and, uh, and win in the West Indies for the first time in about 39 years. In the crucible of that tour of, of 1995, you saw how uh, Steve Waugh could, could rise to an occasion and they were massive occasions filled with enormous drama. Because I think he could sense what the stakes were, 
that if he could come out the other side, then Australia would be world champion and they would have something to defend in future. I've got a tattoo on my backside, not many people know this, of a kangaroo kicking down a palm tree because it's the first time we'd won in 30 odd years. And for me, it was the fall of the West Indies. These blokes who I had watched since I was a little kid and then we finally beat them. It really was um, the end of their dynasty and we sort of took over from that moment. So it was a significant tour. Over the next two years, Steve Waugh's resolute batting formed the backbone of Australia's success. By the middle of the 90s, his technique has kind of contracted to this alamo of, of ordinary defiance. He's become kind of this bulwark, this last line of Australian resistance. Stephen was playing brilliant cricket, scoring a lot of runs. He was a leader within. I definitely put him in the top three at that stage. I think I was ranked number one for two or three years there in a row and um, yeah, I just felt as if I had c c command of my game and more so probably my mindset. He did jobs for us that were amazing. I think I was just very confident when I walked out the bat, I, I expected get, to get runs. Invariably, he got tough runs and what, what I mean by tough runs is that, you know, his side might be 50 for three, the pitch might be a bit dodgy. Um, and he would get the runs, so runs that all, almost counted double sometimes. There was a particular test match at Old Trafford in 1997. Absolutely key game, one all in the series, only three matches left. Stephen played a couple of amazing innings. Each time he came in, we were about three for 30 each time, so in a little bit of trouble. And like I said, that's where Stephen thrived. He got two hundreds in the game that were the difference between Australia winning that match and losing it, and probably the difference between Australia winning the Ashes and losing the Ashes. By the late 1990s, Steve Waugh had become Australia's main man. And when Captain Mark Taylor retired at the end of the 1998 season, Waugh was the obvious candidate to take over the Premier job. I took over a captaincy at 33, which is pretty old when you think about it. And I'd been a player in the team since I was 20, so 13 years as one of the boys, one of the players, you know, all of a sudden you're captain. You've actually got to make it happen and you've got to stand by your calls and, and you're the one that people are looking to to make, make tough calls sometimes. One of his great um, attributes as a leader was to pinpoint a time when he needed to talk. Again, he didn't talk very much, but when he spoke, you listened. I was never one to stand up and make a big speech before the game or, or before we went out in the field. I'd rather do my work behind the scenes, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, in a relaxed situation. And that's where I feel most comfortable, passing on my message and my knowledge and, and mentoring. I enjoy that. The first test of his captaincy would come against none other than the West Indies the team he had helped overcome four years previously. Many occasions we have Australia on the ropes and he walk in and then next thing you know the game change. I mean for instance in 1999, right in Barbados, we had Australia flew down for not too many ones. And Steve would walk, walk in and we thought well if we get him out now we could have the game in our hands. He made 199. It <laughs> changed the whole game completely. Despite war's best efforts, Australia struggled to contain the West Indies and looked set for an unlikely defeat. My first tour as captain here, we were down 2-1, going to the last test in Antigua. It was unbelievable. This is not going to plan. We've got to win this last test. Let's pull our heads in. I guess I took the unprecedented step of dropping Shane Warne, who was my vice captain, leading up to the last test. That's a tough decision for everybody. I mean, you just drop the greatest cricketer this race has ever produced. It was a pretty gutsy call and uh, well, I could have had a short career as a test captain but um, I'm actually glad I made that call in a way because I, I think I proved to myself that at the end of the day I would always put the team first before the individuals and I'd always try and pick a team that was good enough to win that test. We went on to win that fourth test to draw it at 2-all and we retained the uh, Sir Frank Worrell trophy because we had it previously. I think it was important for Steve as well that in his first test series that we at the very least retained it, uh, even though we didn't win it. I probably learnt more about my captaincy and leadership abilities just by making one decision, even though it probably wasn't the most popular decision. Um, deep down, it was, was the right decision to make. War's next challenge as Australian captain was just days away, the 1999 World Cup in England, and the chance to crown his Australian side 
as the best one-day team in the world. We sort of just rolled out of that West Indies tour straight into England, so we are away for five and a half months. And all our players were a bit fatigued and homesick. We had to win seven games straight to, to win the World Cup, and with those players, once you got momentum going our way, we were a really hard side to stop. Steve Waugh proved the difference in two epic encounters against South Africa, propelling his country to the final in typically determined fashion. But we somehow scraped past South Africa and then we saved you know, our ultimate game for the final against Pakistan where we probably played the best game of one-day cricket that um, I've ever been involved in. He made one-day cricket important to Australia. That was his legacy. He had one of the great teams uh, that cricket has seen. You can talk about Bradman's Invincibles in 48, the West Indies team of the 1970s, 1980s. And then you've got the Australians of the late 90s and early 2000s. I knew we had a really talented side and we were winning more so than losing, but I just felt we could almost go to the next level and really write our own name in history uh, as one of the great sides. And, a big part of that was getting John Buchanan to become coach. And I still remember he walked in with his clipboard and his thing and his funny mo and his... And we're sitting there and he said, what do you guys want to be remembered as? So we're going on a journey to Everest and um, as you know, Everest is um, highest mountain. Not many people get to climb it. I can still picture it. Warney sitting there with his fag. Mark War sitting there with his sweatbands sort of doing his hair going, well, what are you talking about? What do you want to be remembered as? By the time we completed the journey, um, we should have left an imprint in Australian cricket, world cricket, and at some point in time somebody might provide a label to the team. Over the next four years, Steve Waugh and his Australian team would dominate cricket like no other side before or since. They destroyed opponents, set new standards, and transformed the game. The environment was uh, all about being a game changer, setting new benchmarks. Steve was very aggressive in terms of the way that he wanted to play the game. Didn't want to give the opposition team a sniff at all and just want to dominate the whole time. So that's the way he played. Our goal was to win every game we played, which if we didn't, then we weren't doing ourselves justice and we weren't um, paying respect to our abilities. Not today we're not losing. Not this month we're not losing. In fact, we're not even going to lose this year. You know, you could just see that was his drive, that sort of sole focus within the game. Even during the West Indies' great periods, they didn't win absolutely everything. But Australia went on every tour with the explicit mandate to win. Anything short of that was a, was a deep disappointment to a, to a perfectionist temperament like Steve Waugh. The rewards came quickly as Australia set a world record 16 match winning streak. And at the heart of every victory was their ruthless captain, who was setting records of his own. That is 10,000 runs for Steve Waugh, the third man in the history of the game of cricket to have achieved that milestone. But by 2004, almost two decades on from his test debut, Steve Waugh was ready to let go. The thing about retirement is there's no right time. And Steve had said it, said it better to me than anyone. He says, when you're thinking about retirement, you've already retired. I think he got sick by that stage of going to every single press conference and being asked retirement questions. He decided to make it explicit. This morning I sent a letter to Bob Merriman, James Sullivan and Trevor Holmes of Cricket Australia, advising them of my intention to retire from international cricket as both captain and a player. But of course because of that, then it almost became every test match we went to, this is a farewell to Stephen. I was pretty much told to make a decision by Cricket Australia um, and, and that's something I did. You know, I would have, in an ideal world, preferred to sort of walk out in Sydney with very little fanfare, but that's the way, way the cards fell. His final innings came at his home ground in Sydney against India. He bowed out from the game in typical fashion, scoring a hard-earned 80. 50 test match 50s for Steve Waugh. With such a successful team, with us playing so well, it was a fitting farewell for the captain and it was a nice way to send him off. In his 20 years playing for Australia, Steve Waugh changed the game he loved. 
He scored almost 11,000 test runs at an average of 51. But most importantly, he was the man who redefined the Australian way of playing cricket. A captain obsessed by history, who made his own. As the history of the game is written, his influence will be more and more understood. If Australia was three for 300, you wouldn't expect him to get 20, but if they were three for 50, you could almost write down 100 for him before he went out the bat. His great innings were always when they were badly needed, and I think that says a lot about the person. I just always played as if um, it was a huge honour to represent my country, and I did everything I could to make the most of my ability. I tried to bring players along to maximise their potential and give them opportunities. I just hoped that I was, I was a good teammate to the guys around me and, and uh, in, in my own way led them in the direction that made them better players.